one of the things I've talked about for years is actually when you are speaking to a group, how do you create the space where you give them a warm bath and a cold shower? How do you actually challenge people while ensuring they feel affirmed? You don't want, you don't want to go too hard on one or the other. I don't, I'm not a fan of, Hey, don't ever change. You're perfect the way you are. Cause we all got to get better. And especially if we're in education and we're asking our kids to continuously grow, do we model that ourselves? One of the questions I keep asking people is, are we actually modeling the learning we expect from our students? And if we're doing that, we want to continuously grow. But I also think the warm bath is the idea of, you know, people need to feel affirmed and appreciated. I know personally, if you compliment me on something, I will go way harder on that thing. I, you know, when I feel this, I will like, you know, I will double down on it. So I think there's that balance of it. And the reason I thought about this is because I had this fantastic conversation. You're going to love this podcast with Sarah Sergo, who's the chief of staff of Frederick County Public Schools uh, in Maryland, who, where I get to actually speak very soon. And so she's going to see me do what she talked about. And she shared this idea of being professionally irreverent. And I'll be honest with you, when she said irreverent, I'm like, I don't know what irreverent means. I've heard the word, but I have no idea what you're talking about. So I looked it up and it basically said, you know, challenging things in a disrespectful or humorous way. And then I said, well, is that a good thing? And she said, no, professionally irreverent. So how do you do it in a way where you challenge people, but in a, maybe in a respectful way where we're questioning things, where we're challenging some of the ideas. And if we don't do this in education, if we don't challenge these things, the reality of it is that's when irrelevancy starts to happen. And we continuously fall into traps, not only in the field of education, where we just do what we've always done. And the only way we get out of it is actually through challenging ideas, through pushing back, asking tough questions. And so Sarah does a really great job in this. And uh, I, I read a quote, and I don't know where it's from, and, but it's not mine. And I'll, I'm going to paraphrase, and I just heard it this week. It was something along the lines of that some people are very comfortable with how the world is. And so they don't ever challenge this. And so, and then you have other people who are constantly, you know, uncomfortable. And so they do challenge these ideas. And so progress is only made through those people who challenge the discomfort. And that's part of it too. And, you know, this, I, I've, I've written about the, the notion of, you know, challenging the status quo. This is not just a, something that we do professionally in education, how we do this personally in our own lives. Where do we actually start to challenge ourselves so we continuously grow? Because through that place of comfort is when we get into trouble. It's, you know, continuously progressing. And I know very specifically, the more I'm willing to challenge and grow, the more purpose I feel I have, that I want to get better. And I think it's really important that we do this in education. And that term professionally irreverent was really, really beautifully articulated by Sarah. I've never heard of the term before. I would credit her for this term. I don't know if you've heard it before, but it really challenged me in a very good way, which she kind of modeled what she's talking about. So I love this podcast. It was a really great conversation. I know you're going to love it as well. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am very, very blessed to have Sarah Sergo, who is the Chief of Staff for Frederick County Public Schools, which I am blessed to be uh, joining right now. I actually... Uh, Iowa, full disclosure, you are the first chief of staff that I've ever spoke to that works in a school district. So I just love the title. I think it's really fascinating. And I'm, I'm curious, like what that, uh, and I'm going to ask this, I'm going to ask you this in a bit, like, what does that even mean? Like, what does that job look like? You know, what's some of the things that you do that, you know, really impact, you know, cause when we're talking, you do some really, really incredible work, but, um, Sarah actually has a, a, a website called lead to support. You can actually connect there. We're gonna talk about this idea of professionally irreverent, but before I kind of get into the, my questions and like, I got, I feel like I have so many based on what we're doing. So we always try to limit this podcast and not go on for hours and hours, which I feel we could do. But, uh, if I could just get you to tell us who you are, what you do, how you got there, that'd be a great place to start. Okay. So nice to be here. I, so I, I love getting to talk about leadership and about organizational culture. So I'm super excited for the time we're going to spend today. 
how did I get here? So this is really a funny story. Um, I was involved in public speaking in high school. And so if you're not familiar with that, it's called forensics, right? And hmm. essentially, I, and I loved it. I had a high school uh, teacher in 10th grade who said, you'd be great at this. And so I got really involved in public speaking. And so when I went to college, my first year of college, I was a freshman, um, I thought I registered for a communications course. <laughs> Uh, it was called Communication Disorders. I don't know why I thought that had anything to do with public speaking, but there you go. And so I go to this class and it's an overview of all of the hearing and speech sciences disorders. And I fell in love with it. And there was sort of a version of me back in the day where I thought I'd go to medical school and I'd be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And so um, I ended up falling in love with it. And that led me down the path of getting my bachelor's and then my master's degree in speech language pathology. I really wanted to work in the hospital setting because that was sort of this marriage between medical school and my aspirations and speech pathology. But in the late 90s, there had been some Medicare legislation changes and they were not paying and having as many positions for speech pathologists. So, hey, guess what? Public schools hiring. So I went into the public schools and, and sort of the rest is history. I very quickly realized I wanted to do more than speech pathology. And so I became certified in special education and did that work. And then I got my administrative degree, mm -hmm. not having any intention of being a principal. I actually thought I'd be like a special ed coordinator and someone who helped, you know, with programming and services. But I was fortunate that I had a lot of mentors who sort of imagined more for me than I saw for myself. And so I had a former principal who was a special educator as well. And she said, hey, um, come be my special ed coordinator. That turned into an assistant principal position. And at the time, this was sort of, this it, and probably still now, it's like pipeline program. So within a matter of three years, I found myself in a principalship. And I was a principal. Um, and it, that wasn't too far of a stretch for me, candidly. I was the president of the student government in high school and president of my sorority in college. So I've sort of always loved leadership, but I describe myself as a leader in education. Um, I've loved leadership. And so I was a principal, loved that work, was successful at that. And then left that job to become a consulting principal, which is someone who trains and mentors first year or underperforming leaders. And then I supervised schools for seven years. Uh, I had elementary and then I had pre-K, middle, high, 26 schools, 18,000 students uh, in one of the larger school systems in the country. And in August of 2022, had the fortune to join Frederick County Public Schools when the superintendent of schools asked me to come there as her chief of staff. So I'm in my 25th year and probably my ninth job within mm. that time, all within public schools. I love that. Hey, so like this, uh, and when, when I hear this, and I, I always really find it fascinating when the different roles that people have before they become a principal, go into administration, and I have been so blessed to connect with some really incredible teachers in, you know, in the areas of inclusion, special education. So what do you feel that you did in that role that really helped support you to become an administrator? Because I don't, I, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong here. I don't know if that's a traditional route to the principalship, but I think it should be. And I think there's a lot of stuff that I've learned from that area that could have an impact. So like, what do you see as some of the things that you did in that role that you learned from that position that really supported you when you became, you know, a, a school administrator and, and, and did the work that you did after that? Yeah, and it's fun. A lot of people say like my background sort of became like a unicorn of print. Like I was, you know, a lot of administrators are sort of afraid of special education. And I use afraid sort of generally, which is this idea that it's unfamiliar mm -hmm. or a place of discomfort because of all the legal and other compliance requirements. And so, I think the first thing that I would say is that that position taught me about how to work with a variety of staff because mm. I wasn't in a bubble, right? I had to be able to either co-teach, co-plan or co-deliver services and resources with a ton of different staff in the school. So I had to learn very quickly how to work with a variety of people and meet them where they were, mm -hmm. which is pretty much what the principalship is, right? So I was exposed to a variety of teaching styles, personalities, systems of instruction, systems of support. And I could, I got a school-wide portrait because I was in so many different spaces and classrooms and mm. grade levels. So that to me is, it was incredibly beneficial. The other thing is I had to be highly organized. I mean, any special educator will tell you right. it's not 
it's not the kids that is makes you burnt out. It's the workload, the caseload management, right. the paperwork. Right. So having to be super disciplined about how I organize my time and how I took care of both working with kids and managing all of those functions. It's again, not that different than the principalship. You got to be in classrooms and be doing all these things and then do the administrative stuff. Yeah. So those are the two things that I think were the most transferable and really gave me a strong start on the principalship. You know, so everyone knows this about me. If you've spent three seconds listening to my stuff, I'm a huge basketball guy and probably my favorite coach ever is Phil Jackson. And I just, he's different. He's, he, he sees things in a different way. And like one of the things I used to love uh, that he did, I can watch basketball. I've watched it forever. And you can tell when a team is getting in trouble that the coach will call a timeout to kind of save them. And I could like tell you, I'd be like, yeah, he's calling, they're going to call a timeout. That's what's going to happen. And Phil Jackson would it. And the reason why is Phil Jackson is like you, he put the people in a situation where they had to figure out how to get out of it on their own. Because at some point his belief was that I'm not going to have a timeout. And so then what, then what are you going to do? So like, I just remember that he was just unique in how he did this. But the thing that I heard from you that I just really, really love that he did is that he would actually, um, you know, he coached Michael Jordan, who I believe is the best basketball player of all time, at least in my lifetime. Uh, he had this incredible team and he ensured that everyone knew they had a differing role and that they all contributed to the success of the team. Not everyone's Michael Jordan, right? Obviously. But like one of the things he did that was really, really simple is that he knew them all so well that he would give them each a different book based on what they, he thought would be most beneficial. And that's what I thought of you is when he talked about like, you had to like kind of know your staff, you had to know who they were as individuals, had to kind of build up the strength. So that, like the, the, the best coach of all time also did that. So I, I just think that was such a powerful uh, example. And I know one of the things that you're really passionate about, I could feel it, you know, when we were doing the pre-interview, is organizational culture. And so when you say that term, what do you mean by it? And why do you believe, you know, it's obviously such an important thing? So I, I, I mean, this is like my absolute most favorite topic. And I think, frankly, one of my superpowers, which is how do you create an environment where people can thrive? Mm -hmm. So to me, like that is what organizational culture is about. And so at a very basic level, from the perspective of staff, it's the what characterizes the employee experience. And so some of, I think you can tell a lot about an organization, frankly, by how they treat people at their worst. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as the chief of staff, I have the fortune and responsibility of being the chief over HR. And of course, any large organization, we have times where people get into spaces or need to be addressed, you know, in ways that 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 their behavior doesn't align with the, the organization or the standards of, of the work that they're doing. And I, I really think it's important and it says a lot about who we are by how we treat people when they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And so even at a, as a building leader, you know, how do you treat people who are not yet where you need them to be? How do you have difficult conversations? What does that look like? Um, how do you meet people where they are? And then how do you respond to people when they aren't um, feeling supported? Um, you know, criticism, feedback, all of those things. How do you create a culture where people can t speak their truth? So organizational culture actually isn't any one thing. It's sort of everything. It's mm. something you feel, but it's much more about the experience that people have. And frankly, I always say, um, who you are is what people say about you at the dinner table. Mm. And so I feel like that's a great measure of organizational culture. Not that we agree with everything or we, you know, we love everybody. It's not that it's like, how do we feel as employees about our, as, as we think about our experience and all of the things that make that up. You know, you know, I, I had a really interesting conversation and I was thinking about this and I don't, I don't I'm curious what your feedback and if you had done something differently here. Um, I think, I think it's Brene Brown and I'm not hundred percent sure talking about the idea of clear as kind, you yep. know, is, is that Brene Brown? That is that is that Brene. Brene Brown? Yeah. So I remember distinctly and you know, this is a long time ago and, uh, someone who is not a good teacher and there is, and there is no support that was going to make that person a good teacher. And I remember, and I knew he knew it and he knew I knew it. 
And I was like, this is not the thing for you, but it doesn't mean you're a bad person. doesn't mean anything. Here's things I think you should explore. Here's things that you should do this. And it was actually amazing how grateful he was to me to actually just be honest and then provide him support, knowing that that just what I don't think like because you go in the teaching profession that makes sure that it ensures you like if you get the right skills, if you do this right thing, you'll some people just don't you're not they're not they're not they're not gonna be good at it. But to like, let them linger and feel like they I, I knew I knew he knew he was struggling. And I don't think he wanted to wake up every day and have that feeling. And so I just, I was very clear with him and, but also supported him in the next parts of his journey and did it, you know, was as respectful as I could be. And he like, and he was a, a wonderful human being. He was a very nice, he just wasn't a great teacher. Right. Well, and he wasn't going to be one like, and he knew this and so did I. So I think that was really helpful. I don't know. I don't know if I'm, the, I, yeah, I'm no, like maybe, a little bit nervous about what I told you. Cause I'm like, Oh no, no, like, no, no. Oh, no. I mean, I, I think, I think, a, you know, reminds me, it reminded me of, of some career coaching conversations that I've had to have with principals. So mm. I'll just sort of draw another example of that, which is I would sometimes say to people, you know, I, I love Brene actually has this other frame that she says, when you're going to sit down and have a difficult conversation with someone, you actually need to name it. And she says, mm. We're going to have a, what may feel like a difficult conversation, but I want you to know that I'm having it with you because I have high expectations for you and our relationship. And I care enough about you to say some things to you that may not feel that good. Mm -hmm. And so I also think like just how you frame those kinds of feedback conversations. But I remember once saying to a principal, you have so many talents, you have so many skills to offer, and this job no longer allows you to manu man you manifest those. And mm -hmm. I would much rather help you use your talents in a way that generated the outcome that you want, but this job no longer does that for you. Yeah. And I, I just think we have to sort of give people permission. I see far too often we get in these friction-filled interactions with people about evaluating their worth and sort of putting their entire identity into, I don't know, some teacher framework or principal framework. And I'm like, that's around this part of the work, yes, but you have so many other things that you offer and right. it just may, may not be this job, may not allow you to show that as, at all times. Uh, okay, I feel better. I feel like I did the right thing. <laughs> so you were I, clear, I, you were clear and you were kind. I was, yeah, and yeah, like I, I actually, weirdly enough, I stayed in touch with the guy, like him and I are friends. And you know, we, and we, we were not friends and not because, you know, because I was his boss and stuff like that, but you know, he always checks in with me and I hear from him and yeah, so I, I feel good that, and he's, he's done amazingly well. He's become amazing successful outside of education. And I'm grateful that, you know, I, I, I will say sometimes people are scared out of a conversation and then they let people linger there. And then, you know, it's, it's not a good place. I don't think that's a good place for that person or for the organization. So I think it, I, I really um, appreciate you. I feel, I a little feel a little validated because I was like a little bit nervous to share that story. So one of the things we talked about, um, and full disclosure, you, I was asking you like, Hey, what are you interested in? What do you like talking about? And you said, um, the idea of, you know, being professionally irreverent. And I was like, I don't know what that means. And so just like my teach my seven year old daughter, Clea, I was like, what does irreverent mean? So I, I just did, I actually thought you were going to say, professionally irrelevant. I was like, I know what irrelevant means. And so I like Googled it and I was like, well, irreverent kind of means disrespectful. Like can be a little bit disrespectful. And you're like, no, it's professional. There's a difference here when I talk about professionally. So I, first of all, I, I think it, one of the things that's really important, I, I think when we say buzzwords in education, I, I believe words become buzzwords when we say them without actually like articulating what they clearly mean. Right. And sometimes people just say words over and over and over again, because they think it's the word they should be saying. But then if you say to them, what does that even mean? And then you, and they can't tell you that's when it becomes a buzzword. So I, so I just asked you and I, I loved what you shared. So talk a little bit about what it means to be professionally irreverent and, and why it's so important. I actually, in full disclosure, I asked Sarah, I loved it so much. I'm going to ask her some questions and hopefully I get to post on my blog, uh, sooner than later, because I just think it's what you shared is so connected to, uh, innovation. And I will say this, I'm like, I do that. I do what you said, but I've never actually had the term for it. And it really made a lot of sense to me. Cause so if you can just share professionally irreverent, sure. why that really matters. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it, what it, I'll, let me start by saying what it isn't right. So it's not about 
saying anything you want. It's not mm -hmm. about being disagreeable. It's not about pushing back for the sake of pushing or being critical. So being professionally irreverent is being deliberate about not just going along to go along. Mm -hmm. And to so there's sort of three things that to me characterize being professionally irreverent. One is asking a lot of questions, right? Because I have I'm the kind of person it needs to make sense for me to sort of get on board. And so it's being comfortable to ask questions about why certain choices are being made or why certain decisions and have we thought about this and have we thought about that? And so creating a, a space where we can question decisions, approaches, all of those things to me is, no, is, is number one. And, and I think if you're in a room where people aren't asking questions, that to me is worrisome. So I, I really think you have to be in a space where you, um, push into this space of asking questions. The second thing I would say is it's a posture of always trying to make things better. So I, it's a it's sort of almost a compulsion of mine that I, I can't ever leave something alone. If I touch it, I have to try to improve it. Right. And, and so to me being a professionally irreverent is pausing to say, does this still work? pausing to say, is this approach, does this serve our goal? I love one of the people who work with me now, I'm always saying is what is the problem we are trying to solve? Yeah. Is this the approach that does it? So the second thing is really also trying to improve. And, and the third thing I think about being irreverent is figuring out what the people in positions of authority and whatever you th that means for you, whether it's supervisory authority or uh, hierarchy or whatever it is, like figuring out what motivates them and approaching issues from their interest base, right? So if you're someone who says, oh, I, could, I can't do all these things with my boss or my organization doesn't have a tolerance for this, I'd say, well, what is it that they're after? Because if they're motivated by excellence, they're motivated by innovation, if they're motivated by accolades, then you have to figure out a way to sort of be irreverent in a professional way right. to show them how doing something maybe just a little bit differently or asking these questions um, might get at what they're really after ultimately overall. So, I mean, I could talk about this, go on and on, but I, I think it's um, making sure you're in a, you are in a space where you are have a positive supposition about the other person, that you are not a, against the work but you are against the idea of just going along without sort of autopsying something and really looking closely at whether or not it works and makes sense. You know, so I, like I was, um, I'm listening to you explain this and here, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to like snip this out. This is going to be like a little clip on YouTube. Um, the, the three things I absolutely love and I'm like listening and how do I do this too? Like, how do I do this? And so I come into an organization, and immediately because they're bringing me in, they're like, oh, this guy's the expert, blah, 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 which I don't think this at all. I actually say like, I'm just someone here sharing ideas and I'm talking to the experts right now. And so your role is to, is to kind of figure out how what I'm saying makes sense to you and how it applies to your context. And you figure this out. I'm not telling you how to teach. I'm not telling you how to do your job because that's not my role. But at the end of my talk, and I usually have this space where I really get uh, personalized learning is I share, I'm like, okay, here's what I need from you. What are your questions? What are your ideas? And what are your challenges? So here's what I'm asking you. Do not challenge me at the end of the day in the parking lot with your friends when I'm not there. Do that in the room. Challenge me here. So yeah. because I don't know if I'm right. And I don't know, maybe I said something wrong. Maybe I wasn't clear enough, but challenge me in this space. And people are like a little thrown off that I'm like actually outright asking for it. But it's the same thing is that I, I want to get better. Like I want to get better and I want to make sure. And a lot of those conversations I've had in those have changed things I've done in the future. Um, and I think people appreciate that because I am open to that as well. But there's another reason I do that too, is I'm trying to model to the administrators. Cause I know you and I, I know we never talked about this, but I'm going to bet you'd agree with me. Not all administrators are leaders and you know, like administrators are role leader is something that is like you, you, you earn that. Right. And I'm trying to model to those, to those administrators how important it is to create a space where you can be challenged, even though you are deemed as knowing 
stuff, I guess. I don't want to say being an expert, but whatever. And so how, how is there ways that you maybe like one or two ways that mm -hmm. you can create a space where administrators be, I, cause I, I guarantee you someone's listening to this and they're saying, that's awesome but my admin's not gonna be like this. So for the administrators who are listening to this, what do you do to help them create that space where that is? Because the thing I do, I do know about administrators, they want their school to be better. They wanna be better. But are they open to that? If you're not, you're not gonna get better. So what do you, how do you help them get to that space where their, their staff feel comfortable challenging them, asking the questions that might be tough? Like how do you get people to create that space where they encourage people to be professionally irreverent? Yeah, I mean, I think I think two things. The first thing is, is you have to start practicing this and making it visible. So what I when I was listening to your story, one of the things I, I was thinking about was one of my favorite things to say to my team is two things that I try to say as often as possible. And of course, when it's appropriate and true mm -hmm. is number one, I trust you. Right. I think saying like, I trust you, meaning not only do I trust you to do your job, but I trust you to. When you're coming to me, like, I trust you're doing that with good intent to make right. things like, all the same thing. The second thing is to, to make visible when you change your mind based on feedback. So, you know, when we've made decisions, if I either got it wrong or I didn't have a complete picture, cause you know, like we're administrators, like I got to make a decision to move on. Right. And so when you're rapid fire making decisions, it's inevitable that you might miss something or not have all the complete understanding you do. So my other favorite thing is to say, to email people and say, listen, I know we made this decision, but I talked to so-and-so and so-and-so, um, and I, they've really provided me with some additional information. Right. And I, I've re I'm, I think I want to revisit this, right? So to model that you are open to changing your mind based on that. So those are the first two things. The other is, I think one of the mistakes that principals and administrators make is we create these feedback loops that stand alone. Like, oh, it's time for our climate survey um, or, right. you know, right. or um, I have to ask you how I'm doing because it's my evaluation year. And so I think the most important thing we can do is make these settings a routine part of our structure. Yep. So every time you have a leadership team meeting or an admin team meeting or a staff meeting, that like it's, it's built into the routine because if you only do it because you have to, or if you only do it because there's a problem you have to learn more about, mm -hmm. then it becomes disingenuous. So you've got to, I, I say my best advice, I say to first year principals, mm -hmm. every single year, ask people two questions every year. What is something that I'm doing as a leader that you think is supportive of your success? And what is something that you think I might want to reimagine or reconsider? Mm -hmm. Ask that every single year and analyze it and tell them what you've learned every single year. And so that's another way of just making it part of your practice um, and not making it just sort of word salad. Like, oh, I said I did this thing. And so that those are two of the things that jump out at me. I love that. I like if any, I hope, oh, geez, I hope people are like listening to this right now because this is like a leadership seminar. I think it's so powerful. You know, I and uh, I used to say this to my staff because I think that feedback thing is really important. I say, look, if I'm asking you a question, if I'm asking for input on this, it's because I'm open to changing what I believe. But I will tell you sometimes I have to make a decision and no feedback you're going to give me is going to change the decision because it's actually out of my hands. So it's something coming from the government. It's something coming here. So if you want to talk about it and you want to complain about it or you want to challenge it, you can, but I'm not like I can't change it. It's it's it, it is what it is, whether I like it or not. So if it makes you feel better to like talk about it, we can, but there's nothing I can do to change this. And so I did that because I hate when I'm asked for feedback that I know is that like you, you feel like no, there, no one listened to you. I don't want to be, it's like, don't, just don't waste my time. Just tell me like, Hey, if you got to do this, just tell me, just tell yeah. me that's what you're going to do. So that was part of my way of building trust. So like, yeah, I'll listen to you, but I understand. But if I am asking for feedback, I am open to changing where we're going with this. And so that people knew that too. And, and I, I feel feel very validated in many of the things I did because I, I made it explicit, like, Hey, this is what we were going to do. And mm -hmm. here's how we did it. And we, you know, asked staff of us. I love this. So well, you I, know, but let, let me tell you this one sure, thing to sure. your point, the simplest way of doing this is to take whatever it is you learn mm -hmm. and do a, you said we will. 
Mm. Okay. So on one side, you say you said, and you synthesize and summarize what you learned, whatever the feedback was. Yep. And on the other side, you do the, we will in the, we will this very important part of this, your bullets on the, we will are going to have one of three words as a starter for every single bullet, continue, consider, or start. Mm. And so what you're saying is there are some places that you're doing well, you want to call out, I'm going to continue to do this thing because you all seem to like it. I'm going to consider this piece of feedback. I'm going to consider changing this, or I'm going to just start something new based on what you've said. If you don't go back to people and tell them what you did with their feedback, they are going to stop giving it to you. And so that to me is just an important sort of bookend on that process. They're going to give it just not to you. <laughs> yeah. They're going to be giving it to their colleagues. They're going to be saying this, to you, but they're going to give it to you. Yeah, I, I love right. it. All hail the teacher text threat. Watch out for that uh, thing. All, of course, <laughs> the chief of staff says all hail. There you go. Very <laughs> presidential thing to say. So, Sarah, it has actually been, well, I shouldn't say actually because it's like I'm not shocked, but it's been really awesome to talk to you. So, I know, I know I'm going to learn more about this. I'm like, I'm feeling some books coming in your future about this stuff. So, um, so anyone who ever thinks about uh, titling their book professionally irreverent, we all know you stole it. So Sarah, you got to get right. on right away. This is that Sarah's book. So this is what's happened. So everyone, thank you so much for listening, Sarah. That was incredible. So thank, thank you so you. much for being on the podcast. Um, everyone, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Take care.